GM friends, and welcome to this Future of Gaming Deep Dive. In this series, we highlight the projects that are experimenting on the edge, builders that are using cutting edge technology to do something new and interesting in the world of games. On today's show, we're taking a deep dive into a project called AI Arena. We have core team members, Wei, Michael, and Brandon here with us today. Um, and so yeah, AI, uh, AI Arena is doing cool stuff, as you can probably guess with AI, but also with blockchain. So uh, there's a lot of interesting things to dive into. But before we get started, a quick round the table with some intros I think are, are useful. Um, Wei, you want to start? Tell us a bit more about yourself and, and your role at uh, AI Arena. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Nico. So my name is Wei. Uh, I am the COO of Arena X Labs, which is the company developing AI Arena. Um, I lead basically everything outside of engineering and art. Um, and it's, it's been an awesome ride just building uh, this project with everyone on the team. So happy to get, get into it today. Fantastic. Michael? Yeah, thanks for having us, Nico. Um, I'm Michael. I work in uh, strategy at AI Arena and uh, sort of support Wei and Brandon and uh, some of the engineering efforts sometimes as well. Fantastic. And Brandon? Hey, uh, I'm the CEO. Uh, I lead the engineering team, um, which means I lead all things gaming, blockchain, and machine learning. Gaming, blockchain, and machine learning. That's These are terms that I like to see used within one term or one uh, within one sentence or one breath. Fantastic. All right. So, um, yeah, let's get started. What is what is AI Arena? Um, who can give us a, a high-level overview? Why do I start? Um there's actually quite quite a few different layers to our project, but let me start at the highest level, which is a description of the game itself. Um, so AI Arena, think about it uh, like Super Smash, but with NFTs. And these NFTs are embedded with uh, artificial intelligence models, specifically neural networks. Now, the gameplay is different than Smash. Um, there's two major components. There is the training loop, and then there's the, the battle. Um, the training is where the human is very much involved. We call it uh, human in the loop and a collaborative effort between the human and the AI, because really what the human is doing is teaching the AI through demonstration. Uh, it's through a process called imitation learning. And, and really the AI learns how to play this game through how the player is able to demonstrate and teach it and coach it through um, different skills over time. So it's a very interesting and novel game loop we're happy to get into the details of what it what it kind of feels like when you go through it. Um, but that's kind of the training section where the human is very much involved. On the battling side, the AI is fighting autonomously in the arena versus other AIs. Um, and really, your AI is battling someone else's AI that they've trained. So ultimately, it is a reflection of the human skill that was injected into the AI, but it's really compelling content to watch because you're trying to figure out how other people are able to actually um, create an AI that's able to do some really cool things. Um, so the, the combination of the two things, uh, we call it, we think is pretty much like a breakthrough experience in, in many ways. I think there's features and aspects of the game where you can say, oh, this feels a bit more like this game, this feels a bit more like that game but to integrate everything together and delivering that entire package, we think is uh, there's no nothing like this on the market. So you're essentially an MMA coach simulator where you're the coach of a fighter, you train them and then you send them out, you're in their corner and you just watch them either get their ass kicked or kick someone else's ass. Yeah, exactly. I think on the, on the experience of watching your AI, absolutely. That's how it is. I think on the, on the analogy of the MMA coach, um, it's almost like, yes, there's aspects of you are the MMA coach, but it's like the starting point was you are actually in the ring demonstrating all of these moves to your um, student, which in this case is the AI, and it is learning through what you are doing, right? So um, there is an element here that, that's important to highlight. Your AI is only as good as the data or the things that you're able to show it. So the human skill element of playing a game like Smash is still very important. And this is a very, um, it may be like a small nuance, but it is important nuance because we wanted to make sure that there is a human element, a human skill injection into the loop 
that makes the entire experience very compelling. Um, because sometimes you can get into a situation where, you know, and we see this a lot, like people make the assumption that if you drop AI into a game, all of a sudden it's supposed to be magically interesting or compelling. We don't think that's the case at all. In fact, if you do it wrong, the AI actually takes a lot away from the actual human experience of gaming. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how this core loop should work to engage the human player, make it very exciting, and make that experience of watching your AI fight so much more exciting. So it's not so much a management situ um, simulator game where you, you make like more high level training and, and resting and nutrition um, decisions for your athletes. It's literally like you're getting in the ring and you're teaching them moves. So it's, what you're saying is that the, the fighting game community, all the hardcore smash um, players that might be, you know, becoming a bit too old to be really competitive, <laughs> can now transfer all of their knowledge and skills to, to your game and, and, and have AI fight, fight their fight. Definitely transferable. Yeah. And, and I think an interesting anecdote, um, we, we, we were asked this question early on was, you know, there's obviously an AI component to this game. Does that mean that people who understand AI have an outright advantage? And through kind of play tests and um, testing this with our early community, the answer was emphatically no. And in fact, the best players ultimately were like, I think some of them may have had some uh, background in playing things like Smash, but really it was just people who were very good at picking up gaming intuition very quickly. And so just, it is more like people who like to experiment with different times of game, uh, types of game primitives really absorbed the, in, and internalized the game loop very quickly. And they ultimately became very competitive on top of the leaderboard. So that gave us the conviction that, hey, we have something here because we don't, you know, we want this to appeal to the masses so that, um, you know, there are aspects of the gameplay where it does lend advantages to different um, profiles of players out there. But the holistic loop really is a function of people just going in and internalizing the game loop, um, albeit a very unique one. Okay, so I'm, I'm extremely curious. Talk me through the game loop. Let's say I, I'm assuming I have to own a, an athlete, like an NFT, to be able to start training them. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe let's start there, right? Um, and then Brit, afterwards, yeah. I guess, after I understand the game, I want to I want to know why they're NFTs. Because mm -hmm. I have a bunch of friends who are like, yo, we don't need NFTs in gaming, okay? So I know they want me to ask that question. Um, sure. But before that, talk me through, um, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, right? I'm, I'm pretty shit at, at fighting games, I'm going to be honest, mm -hmm. um, but maybe maybe I can be a good coach, right? So what do I do? How do I get set up? Um, and then how do I train this this NFT? Brandon, do you want to take take us through the sure. game loop? Yeah, yeah, I'll take you through the game loop. So basically, there's three kind of big aspects to the training loop. Uh, the first is data collection. Uh, and this is similar to just playing a game, right? Because what's happening is you're just playing against some CPU. It can be your AI, it can be another one. Um, it can be just like a dummy if you just want to show it some moves. But you're, you're actually playing, whether it's with a controller or a keyboard. And what's happening in the background is that we're actually collecting data on things that we call state action pairs. Right? So in every scenario, which we call a state, what is the action that you did? And so we compile this huge data set, uh, which we'll use to actually train the AI to learn how to fight like you. Uh, for example, if you were off the stage and then you jump to move towards the stage, we capture that. And then we should tell the AI, when you're in this position, do that. Uh, so that's the data collection part. Next, once we have that and we played the game, we move on to training configuration. And this is where you tell it, what you want it to learn and how you want it to learn. Uh, so for example, you can say, I want this training session to just be marginal, right? I don't need a big over overhaul of like how you do things, just like incrementally improve. And then you can also say for this one, I want you to specifically focus on the fact that you are heavier than your opponent and you have more power, right? Or maybe you wanted to train it to, to fight, for example, much heavier people. So you're saying, okay, I want you to focus on the fact that you are lighter, right? And I want you to focus on the fact that your health was a lot higher than theirs as well, right? And so you can toggle and say, okay, focus on this and train in this way. So that's the training configuration. And then after that step, you actually run it, it improves the neural network, or it can make it worse if you train poorly. <laughs> um, but it changes the neural network. And then you hop into the third step, which is what we call the AI inspector. It's almost like diving into the brain of the neural network 
and we create uh, what we think is a really intuitive UI uh, to basically analyze what it'll do in every possible scenario. So you can like move your fighter around, you can change the number of stocks you have, change the, the damage done, um, put it in different scenarios. You can even construct your own stage, right? You can put different platforms, different places, put different projectiles in there. It's almost like Super Mario Maker where you can create your own environment and you want to see what your AI will do in every possible scenario. And from there, you can zero in and say, okay, it was weak in this spot when I move it over here. Um, let me go back into training. I'll put my, myself in that spot and show it what to do from there. And then that's kind of how the loop uh, happens. And then it's an iterative process of continuing to improve and improve and improve your AI until finally it's ready to battle autonomously. How, as a player or as a coach, I mean, do I know what is a good or a bad move? Mm. Um, that's a great question. You have to have intuition for how fighting games work. Um, so you, you kind of have to know in this situation, should you be, for example, if the opponent is using a shield, you probably want to grab the opponent, right? Um, and so you have to understand certain mechanics of a, a fighting game, specifically like platform fighters. Um, another one is, for example, if you're off stage and there's no platform below you, you're probably going to want to try and move towards the stage, right? So it's just understanding these concepts of what it means to do something at least not bad. <laughs> and then as you face other AIs, you realize that, okay, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't optimal because they beat me in this situation. And we actually have a, a simulation mode where you can uh, test it out against pre-trained AIs to see if your AI is actually good because that's prob you're probably going to want to do that before you actually go into the ranked battle um, and have your ELO score impacted. Mm -hmm. And then can you also battle your own AI? You can. Okay, you can. so I guess ideally the way you would play it, and, and feel free to, for, to correct me if I'm wrong, is you initially, you have a blank slate, right? So you're yeah. initially like telling him everything I do, just learn from this. After yes. a while, you start tweaking it where you're like, okay, like now, now focus on, on movement specifically, whenever, I don't know, specific scenarios. And then you start tweaking it even, even more until the point where everything that you've tweaked together becomes a better player than, than you are yourself. Exactly, exactly. That, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, is that you want a very intense training session to start because it doesn't know how to do anything, right? It's just taking random actions. Uh, and then you start marginally tweaking things around the edges. Um, and and one, one thing to note here is that um, you're probably not going to want to train against your AI when it just starts um, because it's just taking really random actions and a lot of times it'll just jump off the stage. So it's like, it's hard to show it things if yeah. it just kills itself. Yeah. Uh, so we give you the option to to basically train against a lot of different types of opponents. Yeah, that's 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 really cool. And so it, it sounds to me that the people who would be good at this are people who really understand the meta of a fighting game better mm. necess better than they have the fingers to execute on it. Because you know, fighting mm. games, I guess, are are well, I'm pretty sure are actually like extremely timing dependent, and yes. you know, you need the muscle memory to execute on all of the different moves. And in this case, you're taking away that problem, and it's literally like um, the people that write the guys on the internet, 40 pages long of, of how to best tackle like this <laughs> very niche specific situation. These are the yeah. ones that actually thrive in a game like yours. Yeah, it's like almost like they know frame seven, they need to do this specific exactly. thing. Um, yeah, I would say they. It definitely helps to understand the meta of platform fighters. With that said, if you don't have um, like good response, uh, like if you're not able to actually play the game, you might not be able to train it well because in order for it to learn, you actually have to demonstrate it, right? So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a, like a fighter off platform and you want to spike them, um, and you're like right here. If you mistime it, you can just like fall to your death. Right, so you still have to be able to time it properly. Um, with that said, there's like there's some leeway in terms of like how, how many like uh, the frame range, but you still have to be pretty good and have pretty solid timing in order to actually show it what to do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I remember watching a documentary about um, is it OpenAI? I think it's it's Elon Musk's AI in Dota Two that first yes, yeah. managed to win from one of the best players in the world in a one-on-one -on -one, and then if i'm not mistaken managed to even win in a 5v5 where five ais beat five human players in an extremely complex game um intuitively 
it seems like a fighting game should almost be easier to train AI in than um, a game like Dota because there's more decisions. I might be wrong here. Um, what, what's what's the connection? How are you thinking about what what they have done, and and like what's your general thoughts on how that compares to what you're doing? Mm, I, I I'm not a, a Dota player. Uh, I, I I do um, remember that though. Um, I, I I hope I'm not making a false statement, but I think the um, one of the big complexities with Dota was this concept of like uh, delayed rewards. Um, so you you possibly do something at one time step and it pays off much later on. Uh, and so it's hard to attribute which action led to that. And so yeah. that's part of the reason why it's very hard. And, but also just the, um, I believe the, the space for like optimal policies is really, really large. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, I wouldn't necessarily say fighting games are easier. Um, I would say maybe traditional fighting games are a little easier. And actually our first beta um, was a traditional fighting game with like health bars Um, and what we realized is that people were converging on some optimal strategy really quickly. And a lot of people were converging on the same one. Uh, and so that's actually why we moved to platform fighters. Um, also a lot of people on the team absolutely love platform fighters and mm -hmm. been playing them for a long time. So it was, it was a natural move, but with platform fighters, there's like orders of magnitude, more decisions that, that you can make at every point in time. Um, and there's a lot more space that you can move around. And so the search space for an optimal policy is actually a lot larger. It's, it's actually really tough um, to, to train something optimally. And especially if we mix in the fact that we can um, basically alter how the stages are configured, right? Like in a traditional fighting game, you just have like a sort of flat plane and then you're kind of going at each other. But now if you have these platforms and you can move them around and we have walls as well, and we can configure all these different things, now it's another problem of being able to generalize well. Because it's one thing to create um, an AI that's only able to perform on a certain stage, right? And it only learns how to do that. But now if we mix it up and say, okay, now I'm going to move these platforms here, right? Maybe I'll throw in a fifth platform, right? Now it's it can't just rely on memorizing exactly what to do on that specific uh, stage. It has to learn a more general way of approaching things, which is actually very tough. Are AIs, the best AIs on your platform right now, able to beat the best players? Um, we are, we're still sort of like testing it out right now. Um, I would say like we actually ran a competition yesterday to, to develop uh, some AIs. Um, and uh, yeah, mine, uh, I, I can't even come close to mine. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, well, part of that is because we have to um, build in something still to adjust for like um, frame rate response. Uh, so, uh, it has to basically match like what a human is able to do right now. It's a little faster. Mm. Um, so like, uh, I think on, on average humans can like press buttons at like, uh, one every 15 frames. Um, so we, we still have to do a little more testing there to match it up to like human dexterity. Um, but I'll, I'll follow up with you once we do and see, uh, see where things land. It reminds me a bit of, of the, and this is completely unrelated to, to gaming, but there is a yearly event held in the UK where um, horses and, and, and humans are pitted against each other to run a marathon the fastest. And it's actually like not even clear cut who wins. It, it changes. So there's horses that win and there's also humans that win. Um, anyway, uh, just unrelated, but uh, it's a fun story. So uh, uh, tonight's dinner party, you know, it's a, a story, <laughs> story to tell. I don't know the details, by the way. It has a name, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, okay, um, this is really interesting. Could you tell us a bit about the, 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 like the status of the project? Um, you've mentioned you've had like earlier versions with like a different game, um, and, but you're still testing things out. So, you know, give us an idea about how many players you have. Is this all still in alpha or beta or um, what's the status? Yeah, maybe I'll take that. So when we started, um, so maybe a, a high level context, uh, we started building this game probably, I would say, uh, was it early 2022, Brand uh, sorry, early 2020, Brandon? Uh, right? Late 2020, we kind of had the idea late. in November 2020 and then we're right. like, okay, we need to build it. So the first version that we tested to, to Brandon's point was like a traditional um, health bar based fighter and it was a 2D version of the game. Um, we tested that game late last year and earlier this year. Um, and this was after we made an announcement on our seed round 
and we quickly gathered like a small organic community of people that found us on Discord. So we started testing the game uh, with that community, got some really good feedback. And um, towards the end of it, for reasons that Brandon talked about, we, we wanted to make the kind of the search space for AI more expressive more, um, so that the depth of the game and the progression is much, much longer um, for people to really kind of get to the highest level. And you have more ability to distinguish skill sets along the way when you have a more vast search space. Um, so that's one of the motivations for us to kind of move to um, this current version, which is um, 3D character assets with a platform fighting uh, setup to the game. We've been in extensive, like, focused development over the last six months. Uh, we effectively went back into like stealth mode <laughs> um, to just uh, focus on the engineering effort involved. Where we are now is that um, we're we're closing in on um, preparing this for uh, public beta tests in um, maybe about a month or six weeks time. Um, so we're starting to ramp up marketing a little bit getting the exposure out there, starting to talk about AI Arena, uh, attracting some more people into the project to be early beta testers. These are still going to be closed betas, but we're allowing a public audience to try out the game now. Um, and, and the way that we're going to do this going forward is we're going to do um, a sequence of these closed betas. Each of these betas are going to be a self-contained mini tournament. They're going to be competitive and they're going to be incentivized uh, with our NFTs. So it's, it also doubles as a NFT distribution mechanism for us um, because it's very symbol resistant and we are better able to align um, the distribution of, of our NFTs with people who we believe are going to be longer term players and potentially more high value added members of our community instead of just having a project that's like purely, let's say speculators or potentially investors. So, um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, these beta tests will start late November, early December, we'll probably have a few of them. Um, and then the idea is like, it'll culminate in kind of an all-star game, if you will, where we pick the best players from each of these betas, bring them back um, for kind of like a, it's almost like a Marvel Cinematic Universe type of like, put all your superheroes and best performers from the past betas into an all-star game. Uh, use that as kind of the, uh, the vehicle to um, launch us into the actual live operations of the game, which we're targeting for probably like, you know, early Q2 of next year. So that's that's where we are now and kind of our plan for the next, you know, three to six months. Fascinating. Let's talk about the fact that you're using NFTs. Um, why is that? Why are you, I don't know if maybe, maybe they're not limited, but why are you not just allowing anyone to come in, you know, just create a free character and train them? Yes. Um, so uh, this also touches a little bit on kind of, um, you know, the business plan and the commercial aspect of everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, to your point, over time, we envision there to be um, both a NFT, call it NFT gated version of the game and a free to play version of the game. Um, and you can think about the NFT gated version of the game as almost like the professional tier of players where they're playing at the highest level. And we really want that to be the most competitive and highly skilled players um, who are really pushing the boundaries of this game and creating very compelling content that's going to be driving interest into the broader AI arena game. The free to play version is the accessible version to everyone. Literally, um, we're gonna make that in a way where there's basically no Web3 component into it. The game is gonna be running in browser. People literally just probably register, log on, and they can start playing the game and experience it. Um, so, and then, but, but I guess it still comes back to the question of like, why even have an NFT version of the game? And I think it's for two primary reasons. Um, number one, if you think about what's happening here, um, the NFTs are really, at the end of the day, the encapsulation of an individual or a group of individual skill that they have injected into a character. Um, this skill is valuable, right? Because you can really see the deviation of skill between the different fighters. And in order to, to record that information, we need a 
a, a mutable layer of record keeping that's impartial and censorship resistant to preserve the integrity of the competition over time. That's very important. And I think NFTs and Web3 blockchain infrastructure really lends itself nicely to that as an infrastructure layer. So that's, that, that's the first thing. And as a consequence of that, as you can imagine, the better your NFT is in terms of its rank, as a reflection of the scale that's been injected into it, the more valuable it should become on the market, right? Because it's able to deliver a certain type of performance that ultimately we will reward with a native token. And the native token rewards will be only really issued to this top tier of players. It's not designed to be shared across the entire base of players because this is the highest level of competition and these are the stars that are earning you know, the outsized kind of rewards over time. So that's kind of the idea. That's number one. Number two is we obviously have ambitions of uh, reaching a global audience. And there's an element of um, an underlying kind of philosophical uh, principle of ours, which is we believe talent is distributed around the world. And what Web3 allows us to do is reach that talent, shine a a spotlight on it, and really kind of uncover that and tell their stories um, to a global audience. So the, the beauty about blockchain is that we can now start to organize and implement and distribute value across a global-based competition, right? This is much easier to do in a Web3 context than a traditional Web2 context where you have to use financial service, like the traditional financial services rails, which are effectively like prohibitively expensive and clunky to actually administer something like this. So for those two reasons, this is why we think Web3 NFTs is an awesome primitive for this. However, um, from a from a business model perspective, the um, ultimate target market, this first step is the play, uh, free-to-play version. That's going to be the one that's going to be you know, really targeting you know, the, 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 the largest cross-section of audiences. And it's the start of the funnel to onboard people that over time ought to migrate up into the more competitive tiers. Got it. And so is the, you know, when you train your NFT, is that training? So that data stored on the blockchain? Yes. Okay. And Brandon can talk to the details uh, there. Yeah. The, the actual, yeah. So um, let, let me separate one thing. So the neural network um, is stored. The data that was collected is not stored. Um, and so... And I, I, I can talk about why uh, it, it'll just be very expensive. Like imagine you're sampling yeah. at um, uh, your, their game runs at 60 frames per second. So you're sampling uh, 60 frames every second. If they train for, I don't know, an hour, everyone that's training for an hour, like you can imagine how that'll freaking destroy our, our, our database. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but we, we have done a lot of work in um, creating some machine learning algorithms that are able to basically um, almost act in the same way as if we were storing all the data. Um, uh, but a- anyway, so so what we do actually store, well, we store the neural network parameters on IPFS and we store the hash to um, that where it's stored on the blockchain. Initially, we actually did store all the parameters for the neural network on chain in the, inside the NFT. Um, but that was for the traditional version of the game. And, and you can imagine that um, as the complexity of a task increases, you're going to need a larger and larger neural network. And so because we were moving to a platform fighter, we realized that the initial um, size of the neural network was too small. And so we needed to scale it up a lot more. Uh, and basically, we hit sort of like limits in terms of how much data we can push in one call um, to the blockchain, which which sucked because I loved having it on chain because we were doing some really cool stuff with like checkpointing models. So like if you messed up your model, you can go back to like basically a previous block and pull mm-hmm. that model and re- refresh it. But uh, we could possibly do that, but we, we can't keep an entire history of all the models uh, on IPFS because it's very expensive. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so so that's kind of what what's stored on chain and not. What's your current stack? Where do these NFTs live? Where do the NFTs live? Yeah, exactly. Like the NFTs itself. So you're using IFPFS, but what blockchain are you using? Oh, uh, we're on uh, Ethereum. We're using Arbitrum for layer two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So 
I buy an NFT, it is a neural network, I train it, it becomes better, and then I can use it to kick people's ass, or in my case, most likely to get its ass kicked. Um, makes a ton of sense. So you mentioned way the, the business model, like the fact that you're using NFTs is around the business model. Um, I guess there's there's two sides here. One, um, do, are you like selling fresh NFTs or like how does how does that work? Yeah, I think ultimately um, you, you can always monetize directly by selling NFTs if you wanted to. Um, uh, you know, I I, I think it, it, at least in the bootstrapping phase, that's probably not where we're <laughs> what we're going to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, um, over time, we may think about that. Um, the other way of monetizing was, is obviously through secondary uh, marketplace transaction, like um, you know, transaction fees and marketplace fees, things of that nature. Um, and then I, I think you know we talked a little bit about the considerations there in terms of like the competitiveness of different type of marketplaces and is all this enforceable and it, are, do you really want to incentivize transaction velocity within your economy? Does that even make sense? Um, for our game, I think we're probably towards the side of it not making too much sense to really optimize for the highest volume of transactions across our NFTs. So. Um, really where we think like the primary um, revenue model is going to be over time is basically like sponsorship advertising, right? Um, that's one component. The other component is things like battle passes um, and getting people who, um, you know, your, your free to play version is the acquisition funnel. Um, they get involved in the game. Some proportion of the people may want to become competitive players um, or they just, you know, they don't even have to be that good, but they just enjoy the thrill of like the competition. They would, they could be entering into um, these specific tournaments that either provide them access to NFTs, so the NFTs themselves can be, in, in fact, the the reward and the purse for winning a competition, um, and then we can you know start to bring on kind of like sponsor sponsor prizes and things like that, and then from time to time we can think about like subsidizing that with our token as rewards as well. There's many different types of reward structures that you can pull together um but but underlying that is a larger base of people that we monetize through things like battle passes which are much more affordable and accessible and it's really depending on the um the utility that that individual derives from kind of participating and competing in that um for all of this to to kind of work over the long term this is why like initially the nfts and the tokens are used as a bootstrapping mechanism so the inflation rate of that um, initial reward will come down over time because the idea is it's real dollars of value that's coming in through like the battle pass system and, and these other revenue generators that are going to be funding for most of the rewards that are being dispersed out to the highest quality of the competitors. It's very much akin to a traditional sports, esports type of model, which we think is much more um, sustainable over the long term. I think that makes a ton of sense. The critic slash cynic in me would answer that, um, you know, when you're trying to build a competitive scene with lots of, you know, traction, lots of fans, lots of engagement and, and big audiences, um, I think one of the strengths of esports and generally all sports is the fact that there's actually humans doing this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can relate to humans. We can see a person that maybe from our hometown or someone that has a, a very you know fun personality that we enjoy watching streaming, for example, in an esports um, setting. How do you see that work when there's just computers essentially doing the fighting? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, we've been asked this before. I think uh, when we look at what has happened already in our beta tests with like the initial version of the game. Um, what you find is that the human element is not it, it is not divorced from this game actually, because when you watch these AIs fight, you understand that the reason the AI is able to perform at this level is precisely because there was a human that helped it achieve this level of performance, and I think in some ways that experience is even heightened even more than when you watch someone you know, directly as a human compete in a game because there's an element of, there's always an element of like just trying to reverse engineer and figure out how, how is it that a human was able to create this outcome in an AI? It's actually quite captivating. Um, and if you look at our community, like if you talk to anyone in our community who's been with us since the beginning, there's already, you can call them like superstars and legends of our game. 
right? And those people are known by their screen names. So if you go into our community and say, there's there's a few of them. There's like UK, there's DQ, and there's Jello, and there's a few more. I'm sure I'm I'm, I'm forgetting, and people, I'm gonna get flack for this when people hear this because they're like, you know, I should be out there, but. You know, the, people remember those names, and and every single time the competition comes back, they're watching for how those players' AIs are actually performing and competing in the arena. So I, I think I don't think it's going to be any less captivating. In fact, I think there's elements of this that's even more captivating to the, than a traditional gaming experience. And I think Michael is probably the best telling the story about how it actually feels to watch your AI battle. So like. Maybe I'll pass it over to Michael just to talk about that. Yeah, the the experience is truly unique, and um, you know, we we keep saying how we're different, right? And and one of the things that we're different about is that you know, gaming loops are all about you know stimulating some sort of dopamine or having some sort of response between the player and what they see, right? And the dopamine uh, hit in this game is completely different. So you know, you have the training aspect, which you're involved, right? You're playing and that's all fun and that's very much mimics a traditional game and then you have the fact that there's this entity that you know you raise it you train it you know when you first get it it can barely walk it just stands still and you train it it starts fighting maybe it starts beating a few pe- players you know and, and it's almost like you're watching um, this separate entity like this child right and, you, and you're training it and you're raising it and it's almost like a self-reflection of your identity on the blockchain and it's improving right and uh you're emotionally attached to your character and as it's fighting right you know it, it's it's eliciting these different types of responses because you know you're almost not in control but you are right a- a- and it elicits a different reaction it's like you always hear from pro athletes how you know the athletes are calm cool and collected right they're maybe in the zone and the parents are the one that are incredibly nervous and they're and and they're the ones that actually need most of the help in that moment and it's why it's because they're not in control right so we're marrying these two elements of gameplay where you know if you love fighting games you're gonna love this because you're still in control you're still training right and then you know you're 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 adding an additional layer to that where it fights autonomously right and, and, and that experience is really different, right? And uh, if you experience that game loop and then you start layering that with you have superstars and, and different training strategies and you start potentially earning from this thing, you know, that experience of itself is, is completely different and, and uh, extremely compa- uh, compelling for what we've seen. Like from our beta test players, you can see why some people were talking about yelling at their screen, at their, at their computer, um, because their AI did some sort of move that they didn't expect, good or bad. So, you know, it, that's all what gaming's about. Yeah. Fascinating. And, you know, once you care for someone, um, it changes your perspective on things. And I can echo that because I have a cat since six months and I love that fat chungus to death. So um, I, I can definitely, definitely see that. And also when, when I asked the question of, isn't it different because it's not a human playing? I, I sounded a bit like my mom who's like, you know, esports, what the hell? There's not even people, you know, playing this game. They're sitting behind a computer. So um, sorry about that. Um, anyway, I, I can totally see it. And, and um, I'm already like, I, I was convinced already, um, you know, let's ask this this already. How can I play this game next time you guys do 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 a launch? And how can other people in FogDAO join as well? Yeah, so we're we're starting to um, kind of populate these uh, different teams and getting people allow listed for the beta. So we'd love to get a team from Fogged Out to to represent. Um, so we can we can definitely set that up. Um, how these uh, yeah basically it works off of an allow list system. We're starting to pull names. Um, the the unique kind of spin on this is so there will be people who are let's say we put together a Fogged Out team. Mm-hmm. Uh, the team obviously. They compete. If they do well, they win NFTs. So we're setting it where it's like the top 50th percentile of finishers earn into NFTs. There's going to be some grand prizes. Um, but in addition to that, if the Fogdow team finishes, say, top three on the team leaderboard, because we're going to separately also keep track of the team score, then the Fogdow community can also win NFTs because their team did well. So we're trying to start to kind of integrate that kind of fan experience alongside 
the play experience um and yeah and just make it much more compelling with like stakes you know with things at stake where it gets people excited and we think that when we bring um, different communities into the fold because we already have some gaming communities uh DAOs and guilds uh, some pfp projects um will, will, will have their own teams when we start to like assemble a lot of these different teams get the leaderboard boat going have some like viewing parties and stuff i think it can make for really compelling content um just to get people really riled up and uh, you know it builds that camaraderie and morale within the group as well to to kind of align behind a particular purpose for that moment in time the more I think, and, and we talk about this, the more I can see it. Because, you know, what you're also doing is, in any other sports, when anyone is performing, by definition, others are not performing. But when you and a thousand others have had one little thing that you added to this entity, this NFT, which you can't almost quantify who did what and who helped most, then it, become, it becomes you, right? And so essentially, yeah. you can have thousands of people playing at the same time. Absolutely. And also, this is the part where we, when we experimented initially, we kind of thought, okay, is this a single player game or is this actually a social game? Because when you think about it, you're like, oh, it's kind of single players, like one player versus player. And, and then we, we constructed this kind of team construct. And what we realized is like, this is a social game. Because ultimately, we do believe the highest ranking AIs are most likely going to be the result of a group of people who are playing it. Um, because you just have different perspectives and skill sets that people are bringing into the fold to train this AI and really maximize its potential performance. As soon as we constructed this team concept, the learning rate increased dramatically across all players. And then now you started seeing really exciting competition um, because you know people are getting together and saying, okay, like, okay, what is the optimal way to kind of fix this problem that we're seeing in our AI? And people start discussing it. People go back and train. There's other meta strategies involved, right? Like you can, sometimes people start trading their own AIs across their teams, right? We didn't allow, we didn't allow like the, the, the traditional like kind of lending mechanism yet, but people figured out a way around it. So, you know, we don't stop any of that. Anything is fair in competition. So it's really interesting to see those type of um, strategies evolve on the meta side of the game that now translates to, you know, really impressive performance of a, a particular individual AI on the top of the leaderboard. This is uh, this is all very fascinating. Um, you know, I feel like there's there's this should could be the start of a new category of games. Um, could you like what's your vision there can we take a step back from exactly like ai arena in the fighting game genre and and could you talk to me how you're thinking about this um from a, like a, a very high level yeah so we we agree with you we think this is like category breaking um i think uh there's going to be a lot of quote-unquote ai games coming to the market in the future um i think what we're doing is we're we have been really thoughtful in terms of how to make a compelling game experience where the AI actually lifts out the human player as opposed to overpowering the human player when it just becomes about the AI, which is quite honestly, I don't know if that's really compelling um, because the players, the humans still have to be the focal point and there has to be this right balance. So I don't know where all this is going, but I know we're on the leading edge of creating something new. And I definitely there will be a category of like AI type games. I don't know if everything is gonna be akin to what we built, but I think there's gonna be a lot of experimentation here. Um, beyond just gaming though, when you kind of start to understand what we're trying to achieve as a project even more, and I, I encourage people to you know go read our documentation. Um, when you think about the big picture mission, what we're really trying to do here is to use the new um, tech and capabilities that are given to us by Web3, by AI, remixing it in a way where now we can use a, a, a form factor of gaming to deliver real world products and services. And what are those services in our view? One service is education, because as people play this game, they're going to start to internalize what AI research is. Without even understanding it explicitly that, uh, that they understand these concepts, they have internalized it just on an intuition level. And 
if you think about um, that type of teaching construct, if you're able to internalize intuition, the academic side of things, the rote memory side of things gets absorbed way faster, right? So if anyone was at some point inspired by playing this game to look into AI a bit more, their learning curve on AI is going to accelerate dramatically, order the magnitudes faster than it would be otherwise, right? So, so I think ultimately there's an element of the um, content creation that's going to happen in AI arena where we feel a lot of it is actually going to be real world educational content where people are going to use AI arena as a teaching tool to illustrate concepts about AI. And this is going to just onboard a lot more people um, because they, you, can, you can see like, okay, wow, maybe like if I play this game, I can actually develop a new skill set that's transferable and useful and valuable in other settings. Um, so that opens up another kind of target demographic that we can distribute into um, and potentially reach. And we think ultimately that allows us to make AI more accessible because AI is one of the biggest themes unfolding today in the world on the technological frontier. So, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is really about talent and is really giving a stage uh, for people all around the world to showcase themselves. And, um, you know, Brandon, myself, Michael, we're all strong believer, the believers of that. We think some of the best people that we've worked with um, on kind of the research side and just in our prior lives as professionals don't come from the like the credentialized routes of like went to an Ivy League school, got a high, high advanced degree. Like they were just passionate people who really wanted to push themselves to really achieve certain things. And we think everyone deserves an equal starting point. Everyone deserves a stage. And what we intend to do is use AI Arena as a platform to uncover and shine a spotlight on that kind of talent base that we know exists globally. And if you look at our early kind of beta testers, just Southeast Asia, Africa, you know, some people from Latin America, Europe, Eastern Europe, North America, it's everywhere. And we love that because it's a proof point of our thesis that you don't have to be like, I was an advanced PhD from this school and therefore I was really good at this stuff. No, like it's, it's people just need the platform to be able to really showcase themselves. And I think there's going to be an enormous kind of signal, uh, signal content or a, a signal by virtue of the fact that if you're a top ranking player in AI arena, that's really worth something. And it signals the fact that you have skill, you have understanding, you have the capability to get to that point. Um, that's going to be valuable um, for that individual, but as a platform, as a, as a network, we're starting to really deliver that value proposition to a very large cross-section of people around the world. So that's really what we're trying to achieve. The game allows us to unlock that opportunity in a way where we don't think it was possible in Web 2. And this is, this is the magic of Web 3. And this is, you know, when we came to conceive of this idea, we really thought, saw the promise of Web 3 from that perspective. And we want to showcase to the world that, hey, you can create radically new solutions that's really exciting in Web3. And how cool would it be if we can deliver this through a game? And just like blow people's minds like, holy smoke, like this is fun, but wait, you can also do these things. Um, and and we, we hope, now we're really, we're optimistic about what Web3 is able to create in terms of like um, realities for the future. And we just want to be um, doing our part to play a little bit of a role within all of that. So this was the first of our deep dives and it's going to be an extremely difficult one to top in the next ones. I mean, this, <laughs> this was, I'm, I'm blown away. This is amazing. Um, I'm super excited. I can totally see your vision. You know, as, as we interact as humans with AI more and more, I can see like boiled down versions of this game being used to teach kids how to like, you know, think about what AIs do and how they learn and, and how to interact with them. Um, totally see that happening um might might be the start of a black mirror episode but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah good well i mean this was absolutely fascinating um where where can people learn more find you and um get involved sure yeah i, I mean the most efficient ways to follow us on twitter um our official account is ai arena underscore crypto um so you can find us there um you can also visit our documentation site uh it's docs 
www.aiarena.io, I believe. And I think those are kind of the two primary resources. And if you go there, you can find our Discord invite link and join us in Discord. Um, and yeah, and go from there. We'll, we'll, we'll become a lot more visible and public about what we're building over the next little while. So this is a great launching point to, um, to getting the word out there about AI Arena and what we're building. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to share this with anyone I know that's interested in, um, in, you know, technology and games. Cause it's, it, as you said, like I, this could be a, a new, new category. Um, very exciting. All right. So way Brandon and Michael, this was fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed having you guys on. I enjoyed even more what you're building and I'm going to be super curious to get a fogged out team together and, um, and, and probably get, get owned. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> best, for sure. For sure. Like, we're all awesome. we're into uh, crypto and stuff, not finding games, but, um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks Appreciate for having thanks us. Thanks so much, Nico. All right, guys. Um, well, uh, listener, thank you for listening. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you your mind was blown as much as, my, as mine was. This was uh, fantastic. Um, if you did enjoy, feel free to leave a like. If you haven't already, join the FogDAO, futureofgaming.wtf, get in the Discord. And um, these dudes are also hanging out there. And if you want to you know, join us in our team, I'm going to make sure we have a team. And you, if you want to help out train these AIs, then uh, make sure to join us and uh, we'll get that sorted. Good. That was it. Um, hope you enjoyed this and we look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Ciao.